Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, good evening. I'm calling to order the planning board meeting for Thursday, March 4th, 2021. And I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance yes, to, to the, the flag. flag of the United States, States of America and, America and to, to the, the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands. and the nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I get stage fright sometimes, forget the lyrics. <laughs> uh, the board members present tonight, uh, I'm Jerry Graybill. I guess I'm acting chair. We have uh, Allison Hurley, Amber Fecto, who are here in the room. We have Michael LaRue, who is on Zoom, along with Paul Amatucci. And we have James, the town planner. I guess go right into public comment yeah so public comment uh, is for uh this isn't for the um hubbard road project i don't have any emails and there's nobody here so if there's no one i guess we can close the pump public comment section yep and we'll move on to approval of the minutes for february 18th 2021 does anybody have any comments or corrections no. No. Okay. If not, uh, we got a vote, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, Move that we accept the minutes. I second that. Okay. Roll call vote. Michael? Yes. Paul? Yes. Amber? Yes. Allison? Yes. And I vote yes. So five. Five yeses. Okay. Moving along, we'll go into the public hearing for site plan review, solar farm, essential services and construction off of Hubbard Road. Yeah. So I, we Dang. had one email come in and I'll read that into the record. Um, but in the, in the meantime, I think this would be a good opportunity for uh, Beth and Mark or anyone else that, that's here for the public hearing. If there's if something um, that hasn't been addressed or any questions or concerns, now's, now's the time to speak up. Yep. Hi, sorry, this is Beth and Mark. It took me a second to find my unmute. Um, you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So Mark attended the site walkthrough a little while ago, and I know he asked some questions. I wasn't able to do that. Um, one of the things is I was driving by I, the one on, I don't know, we're we calling it 236 or yeah. whatever the other one is on the other end of town that I hadn't noticed previously was all the construction trucks and um, trailers and things like that. So I guess I was wondering what that might look like up here. Um, you know where we are, right? We're right on Forest Lane, which is interesting. All of your notes have us one R and we are two R's as far as that. I looked at the letter, I'm like, Forest Lane, F-O-R-E-S-T, and yet we're F-O-R-R-E-S-T, according to what they told us when they marked our lane. <laughs> I know, I, I Googled it, and I think Zillow or something had you with one R, so that's my, that totally, yeah, after I, I mean, sent the letters, I totally was like, oh yeah, that's two R's, so. No, that's it's fine, point. it's just the town gave us F-O-R-R-E-S-T one, but, so that's, uh, that's <laughs> beside the point, but, so I guess I wondered, is there any way that you can help me to understand what that might look like for us during the uh the build time you know you know with the contractors coming in and out and debris and and things like that sure so this is the public hearing so the engineers here um you guys can we'll write down the questions and then we'll they'll address it in uh, old business okay okay are there any any more questions i guess it's just i guess it's just you two so um I did have an email. I'll just read into the record. There are a series of questions. One question is regarding upkeep and removal of ground cover, weeds, bushes, et cetera, after solar panels are in place. She understands that excess radiant energy from solar panels often speed up the organic growth nearby and under panels, thereby requiring frequent removal and or trimming to make sure the underbrush doesn't grow up too much to block solar panel access to the sun. Uh, our first two-part question is, uh, what is the plan ongoing process for removal of such un unwanted vegetation? 
Does it involve the use of herbicides? If so, what is the plan to monitor wells and the Salmon Falls River? They would like to know how much of a tree buffer will remain in place between the properties. They would like to know how um, close the panels will be and if they can expect unwanted vegetation growth or unsafe conditions on the property and ask questions if there will be glare from the panels. So if there is no further comments, we can close the, uh, up to you, Jerry, if uh, there's no more comments, we can close the public hearing unless there's any more questions or comments or concerns. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Yep. Do I have to take a vote? No. Nope. So. That's on you. Yep. Okay, so public hearing is now closed. Uh, moving on to old business. So Drew, did you catch that? First question about um, Forest Lane and what the uh, construction vehicles and, and, and the impacts of Forest Lane. And I'll just make a note. I, that's one of the first things that I've thought of is um, the impacts of Forest Lane. And, and, and there's one condition of approval, a uh, condition of approval that we'll be working on tonight is making sure that whatever the impact is the Forest Lane, that it's fixed. You know, if there's, if there's okay, sure. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think I know that yeah. we might have missed that comment, but this falls right in line with that. So if we could just, oh, one, you want to ask something about the power, which is different. So. Now, as far as the power is concerned, does that have any effect on us? I mean, is that how we're going to get our power or what's the... So with, with respect to the power, no, that that I'll let I'll leave that to Brett. Brett Pringry is um, he's the developer with Soltage. He should be on in a few minutes, um, coming late from the site walk. Um, but no, it's not like the energy from the adjacent field is going directly to your home. That's not really how it works. It goes out through poles out to the three phase out on Hubbard Lane. Um, so he can get into the the weeds of the the electric piece. Um, but that it, it won't go directly to your house if, if that was the question. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, turn, Jim, thanks so much for considering, you know, just what our uh, in and you know what our lane will look like, you know, during and after, um, you know, what I assume will be months. Or Marcus said, I think six months is what he said that have, during the site walkthrough that would be impacting, you know, a gravel right of way. Yep. So again, I don't want to speak for Brett. Um, just as we, so, just as a backup, I'm the civil engineer and project manager. We're a consultant to Soltage, um, so we help them throughout the permitting, the engineering, the surveying, environmental aspects. Uh, but yes, as Brett was mentioning on the site walk, um, we didn't, you know, notice the ponding and heard comments about the poor condition of the road. And Brett did speak to that about the road would be maintained and filled in with potholes so that you know construction traffic could access the site. Um, yeah, in terms of truck traffic, um, you know, staging areas, things of that nature, the, the construction time period he was talking about was about four to six months. And typically what they do for the delivery of the materials, it's a large flatbed truck that'll come in and they'll offload. So it won't be like it'll um, be in front of the houses on Forest Lane, they'll come all the way to the end. And typically the first thing is the, the site prep and tree clearing. So oftentimes they'll do that deep into the project area that won't be out on the main road or you know the forest lane area. Uh, so typically those trucks come in, they offload them and then they go. Um, but again, Brett can speak into more details of, of traffic in and out, but really that's the construction time frame is the four to six months and then after that, it's pretty much just sitting there quiet with the maintenance vehicles coming, you know, once or twice a year. I don't know if that answered the question. Yep, thank you, that, that gives an idea, yep. And you have a series of rocks at the end of Forest Lane, right? That's the construction lay down that um, won't carry the debris over through Forest Lane and onto Hubbard Road. Right. Yeah. As part of the plan, the plan said we call it a construction entrance or construction exit. It's it's a larger stone that's meant for the construction vehicles coming in and out of the site so that if it gets muddy or the tires get full of sediment, they go through this um, construction entrance exit with stone. And 
it shakes the sediment off of the tires before they get out to the paved area and out to the main road. I can read one of the, I mean, I know where Brett's on his way to, uh, was it Falmouth from? from yeah, Brett? yeah, we can proceed. He, he's, he'll he be on when he gets on. We don't have to wait, but if, if we want to go through more questions, I'm happy to, happy to discuss. So, so basically what Drew's saying is their lay down area will be back in where the solar panels are going to be and really won't affect the people who live along the road. Right, like the- I take what he's saying correctly. Right. Like, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to say you're not going to see trucks going by and that sort of thing, but right. it's not like they're going to stage materials out on Forest Lane in, in front of the abutting houses out there. Typically, okay. um, what I'm thinking of other projects they've constructed, the access roads get get into the site where the fenced area is, and that's where they'll, they'll drop their pallets for the panels and the racking and 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 things of that nature. They won't oh, be okay. stacked, stacked out on the road. Okay, that'll be good. I mean, we have our own tree line buffer right from the, our part of the property, but in that circle, right, which is where the entrance will be, that's, you know, that's pretty wide open, but you'll be some, Mark said 50 feet or so inside that. So that's good to know. Yes, that's what we looked at at the site walk. There's, there's the property line. I can share my screen if it helps people visualize, but there's the property line and then there's 50 feet back from that where the fence and the tree cutting is. So there's there's nothing happening in that first 50 feet back uh, from the property line. Good, thank you. Sure. Okay. I know um, they had also given the option, Beth and Mark, to add um, additional coverage um, to some of the abutters' properties. Um, Drew, I know you uh, heard Brett talking about that a little bit more today than I did, um, but that is an option as well if you feel like you're coverage is kind of sparse where you're seeing the uh, the solar field go in. Yep, yep, Brett definitely spoke Great, to that. Thank you. The uh, Soltage on other projects is familiar with, you know, the concerns of the abutters and the public um, in terms of view shed and screening. Um, so we did walk the perimeter. Um, if it is helpful, I can, um, maybe I'll bring up that aerial plan um, just so it helps. So I'm not sure if you can tell while you while you're looking at that that'd be great and, and I'm Amber I'm, I'm not sure if you guys can tell us this or not but um, did, have you heard from our other neighbors on on, on Forest by any chance are you able to tell me that uh, there is I'm, I don't I'm sure I'm not sure if I caught are you four or is it four and three Forest we're four we're four let me see. Yeah, so in terms of the screening, um, so we, we came in the site and we parked. Can everyone see the screen here? Yep. yep. Yeah. We came in, came in Forest Lane, parked at the end here and, and walked in. So the, uh, the property line is this outermost line here. Great, okay. And then um, Mr. Stuhl uh, was kind enough to go out and flag the 50 foot setback where the, where the fence line essentially is, especially on, on this area. So we, we walked essentially around this area. So, um, so yeah, as, as we were walking and talking, uh, Brett talked about screening um, for this property, the Molten property, uh, back in through here, possibly a hundred foot length of um, you know, arborvitaes or, or cedars mixed in with um, some forsythia or some lower type bushes to create um, you know, not just a, a straight line of trees, but more of a, a landscape screen um so that was one section in through here for the molden property and then as we went up we stood on this corner um we were all getting our bearings out there but we were right around this this corner as we turned west and then got into the perry property um who those folks were out there so this was another 100 foot stretch that we looked at here uh, and then we walked all the way to the end to this last corner here um, for the kinsley property um, as another, I don't, I don't believe they were there for the walk, but another potential section um, there. And again, this is the existing path uh, that's going down to the stream. Um, so we could see where the property line was on the abutter side, and then the flagging was 50 feet back on this side. So there's a good amount of distance from the houses to the property line, then plus mm -hmm. the, the other 50 feet back to where the tree cutting and the fence line starts here. Yeah. Great, this is a great graphic, thank you. Like I said, I'm sorry I couldn't make the walkthrough. I already had a, another appointment and maybe Mark asked this and we haven't had a chance to catch up, but um, 
it, not that we do it as often now that there's, there's that nice, uh, you know, community um, walking trail, walking trail, not far down the road, but we did use to snowshoe out back here um, periodically. So I don't know what, I don't really know our rights in that area now, or if there are any, or. I'm I sure Mr. Mr. Sewell could speak on, on behalf of, of the owner. My understanding is that it's, it's all the, the sewer and, and Sewell, excuse me, and uh, the Ain Holdings property. Um, we did talk about some right of ways back in the conversation on the field today, how historically there used to be a right of way and then um, the Sewell family re, re attained the property here. So it's all under the Sewell or the Ain Holdings um, LLC. Uh, okay. or, that, yeah. That's fine. It's nice that we have that. What is this? I can't remember the, the uh, conservation key, key, key conservation key group or something. We just basically drive down there now. So it's, it's fine. Okay. Do you want to go over the other questions from the email? I actually, um, are you waiting for, uh, I did get another email and that was a question about, um, it was a question about home values. The, and Brett and Brett's here now. Um, any comments on potential impacts in neighboring home values, and then just generally cover the the hazards um, for a solar farm, if, if you would. That'd be great. Yeah. Hey, um, sorry, I'm a few minutes late here. Um, yeah. So there's, as far as property values, there's no data to suggest that there's an increase or a, a decrease in values. Um, th there just isn't any data to support that. Um, so I, I don't have a whole lot to say on that matter, uh, except that there isn't um, any data to, to support that. Um, as far as hazards, there aren't hazards either. Um, we talked about it, you know, it is a, um, an electrified facility. It's a power generating uh, station of sorts. Um, and so as such, per the electrical code, we're required to uh, maintain a seven foot chain link fence around the array uh, for safety. And um, we can you know, talk about their sep uh, several options on how, you know, what kind of chain link fence or uh, the color of the fence or um, you know, whether you put barbed wire on it or not, I wouldn't suggest barbed wire, but that is within the electrical code um, um, optionality. Um, we also talked about um, we could, you know, raise the fence uh, some distance off the ground to allow small critters to, to, to pass underneath. Um, but as I pointed out in the walk today, you also don't want, um, you know, small humans like, uh, people or kids to crawl under either. Now that's a different kind of critter, uh, that is less, you know, we don't want them in the array because they can get hurt, you know, if they, if they mess around. So, um, if it's fenced in, you know, deer, the deer aren't going to get through the fence or large mammals. I'm, I mean, I guess you could argue that they can jump the fence, um, but typically uh, the large mammals just work around the array. There's lots, it's forested on 360 degrees around the array. So the animals um, have plenty of room to navigate around. Um, as far as other hazards, um, you know, some people express concern about pollutants from the array um, and and that again is there's no there's no evidence or case studies of panels producing any type of pollution or groundwater impacts whatsoever um, and I can explain why that is um, first off there's uh, the there's underground conduit um, just like the conduit that goes to to houses or buildings plastic PVC piping that's underground um, and it connects to a collection point within the array and the panels themselves are 
are 90 plus percent glass with some steel or, uh, or aluminum. And those glass panels are vacuum sealed and that they need to be vacuum sealed in order to conduct electricity and, and perform. We monitor this project because our investment is based on these panels operating at, excuse me, operating at near 100%, 98, 99%. And we monitor them every day. <clears throat> and we have alerts if any of these panels stop producing or, you know, for instance, if somebody threw a rock and broke a panel, uh, the performance is going to be degraded. We're going to notice that right away. And we come out and remove it uh, within a number of weeks at most, because every panel that isn't performing at its optimal level is uh, affects the profit of the profitability of the of the solar plant. So these sealed panels are designed to operate for 25 years. Um, the industry is finding that they're in often cases are operating longer than that. So they're, they're self-contained, they're vacuum sealed and they don't move and, and, uh, they, they, they sit there and, um, I don't believe there's any hazards. Uh, there aren't any hazards, um, to speak of, um, happy to talk about any other questions that people may have around them. Um, yeah, Brett, James, James had brought up the Perry's email, um, which we addressed a lot in the field and you hit out a few. There's there's no, and James, I think to go back through, there was no herbicides or fungicides or anything like that. You, you maintain the grass. It's, it's, a, it's a local grass seed mix, often with pollinators, uh, low growth, low maintenance. So you go in once or twice a year for mowing. Um, it's all within the fence lines. So I think they had concerns about vegetation overgrowing the fence or coming onto the property, but it's all maintained within the fence. Um, that's part of your own end plan. Um, the, we, we identified the tree clearing limit out in the field, how that's all 50 feet back from the property lines. Um, and the glare, we talked about that as well, about how the, the panels absorb the light, don't reflect. They're, they're all south facing away from the homes anyways, but even if the homes were on the other side, um, these arrays are next to highways and airports. Um, so glare is not a concern uh, with the FAA or, or state DOTs. So I think we addressed a lot of that with the Perry's in the field, but I, th I think James, I think that went through um, the native grasses, the herbicides, um, the tree cutting glare. I think it was, that's mainly what their concerns were that, that I heard. One of the questions that wasn't addressed yet was where does the power go? It was one of the. Yes, yeah. right before you got on, I was saying that it, the power doesn't come straight from the array right to Beth and Mark's house. It goes out through your series of poles out to the three phase out on Hubbard Lane. But I thought that if there was electrical questions, you could get into more of the weeds with your, your interconnection agreement with CMP, if that was what the question was geared towards. Yeah, so um, as part of the legislative um, as part of the bill, uh, LD 1711, uh, the utilities are required to contract with us for the receipt of the power. Uh, the utilities, they, they fought this uh, bill. They, they don't, uh, they don't want to pay, um, you know, the, the 12 or 13 cents for, for the power, uh, but they're required to do it. And they're required to do it for 20 years. And so the power then gets, uh, that we generate, um, gets basically dumped into the grid and just mixed with all the other electrons coming and going. So there's no real traceability per se of these, where these electrons go. Um, they, get, they get mixed into the greater network and, um, and, 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 and they get dispersed. So, um, I mean, probably some of it is getting used locally, but it really, it doesn't, um, it, it's not specific. You can't guarantee that. Um, one of the nice things about this program is that the value of this renewable energy um, is being distributed. So we, before we can make this project viable, uh, we have to, 
find business partners or municipality partners to um, agree to buying the power at a discount. So we, uh, we haven't um, negotiated that yet with, for this project, but we will um, find you know, some businesses, manufacturing or municipalities that will uh, agree to, to sign long-term agreements uh, for this power and that's, um, you know, a way to share some of the benefits. So um, I think that would probably answered more, was more of an answer to your question you were looking for, but if I didn't answer it, let me know. I think that was a good time. If any of the board members have outstanding questions. Okay. Anything? No, I answered all my questions. <laughs> I'm all set. Michael, you have any questions? No, I'm all set. Paul? Yes, I just have uh, one question relative to the decommissioning and mm. the cost for that. And uh, it became a, uh, a topic last time that we met and, uh, and you were very forthcoming in, in giving us samples of that. Um, the bond that you post, uh, the uh, for this, that is put, um, that, that is based on today's costs, not 25 years from now costs. So what factor do you use to determine whether that's really gonna cover it in 25 years or that's not, not enough? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what goes into that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the agreements that we, that I shared with you from the town of Naples and the town of Acton um, did not have that any escalator or look back provision in those agreements. In talking with James, what I what I I think I shared some language that I suggested where whereby we put um, language in the um, conditional in one of the conditions that um, would say, and I don't have it in front of me, James, but it was basically that every five years we would have um, a, an update on the uh, decommissioning costs for the project, um, you know, an update conducted and the costs adjusted accordingly. So that I think that's fair and makes sense. And, um, and then what, you know, what would happen is if the costs go up, um, or down, uh, our, you know, our premium would change accordingly and it would, it, but, and they would adjust the, the, um, the bond, the underwriter would adjust the bond accordingly. All right. Yeah. That, that sounds like where I was, where I was going, uh, uh look back, uh, periodically just to, just yep. to see if we're covered here, uh, with the decommissioning costs. So, yeah, I think five years, I mean, I think five years is probably a fair number. I think every year would be, is too much. I don't think no. you're going to see much fluctuation on an annual basis. Um, 10 years might be too long. So, I, you know, five years, I think makes sense. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I can, I can go over some of the conditions of approval. Okay. Um, I, I didn't anticipate tonight that there'd be an approval of the application just so we could Should get the conditions of approval squared away. Um, I'm not sure if, if you guys are making any amendments to the site plan to provide that buffer or are you, are you guys actually adding screening? So we, uh, we did, uh, I, you, Drew may have covered it. Um, in meeting with the abutters today, we agreed to providing visual some landscape buffers to the three um, homes that you know may have some um, you know may may see some of the panels and um, so we haven't prepared um, the, uh, the the drawings for that um, that isn't hard for us to do to prepare um, the site plan uh, to show the the location and the specific uh, vegetation buffer that we would put in 
Uh, but that's something we could do within a short amount of time. I, I mean, that's really a question for, for Drew because he's the one that, that's going to do the work. Um, but yeah, we, that, that, that's something we can easily take care of, modify the site plan to show the screening areas, show some species, you know, the length, um, and point out, you know, those three properties I mentioned, um, the Moulton's, Perry's, and Kinsley's, if, if that was desirable, which it seemed to be in the field. Yep. Okay, I can uh, read through the, just get the wording right here. So before a certificate of occupancy is granted, a stamp decommissioning plan and proof of a surety bond in the amount recommended by the plan taken out on behalf of the town of Berwick shall be submitted to the Community Development and Planning Office. If the solar farm, this is number two, if the solar farm starts stops producing power for one year, the property owner shall have one year to implement the decommissioning plan. The bond shall be called by the town and the bond shall be released to the town for remediation. Number three, the applicant shall keep the surety bond active and current. The cost estimates for the decommissioning plan shall be updated every five years to reflect cost changes. Number four, I think the wording on this can be probably improved, but I just have pictures shall be taken of Forest Lane or, or Jen, our code enforcement officer can go out and we can document the, the, the current condition of, of, uh, of Forest Lane and then any damage shall be fixed. I think that's fair. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then number five, um, this was more, I mean, I think you guys might be addressing some, some landscaping. Um, I'd be curious what the board thinks, what you guys think. If a gap in the screening is determined by the Community Development and Planning Office, the applicant shall come back to the planning board to submit a landscaping plan. It sounds like you guys are being proactive, but I mean, we can talk yeah. about this. Yeah, um, what do you think, Drew? I mean, we are going to act, we're going to commit to that landscaping plan. Um, it sounded like uh, before, I mean, it sounds like you're doing a landscaping plan. Um, so I think um, now that you're doing a landscaping plan, this one might be um, unnecessary. Yep, yep. Uh, that was my question. If, if it's showing a gap now versus what we're going to improve and show those areas, so fill that gap as it's not shown now. Or if you meant maintenance and upkeep of that, I wasn't sure it was clear of the gap. Well, I think before now. Yeah, I think last meeting we just weren't sure where the gaps were. It sounds like you went out and explored where the gaps were. Right. Yeah. That's all I have. Okay. Any more questions, comments? If not, we'll close old business and go back to public comment. If there's anyone. We'll see you on uh, March 18th, everyone. Is that the next meeting? Is that what that you're saying? Yep. Okay, I just had a couple things, but I, I they're, very, they're really simple. So should I do this now or? Up to, up to the chair. Yeah, I guess so. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, not, not, I'm not very good at planning how I'm agenda <laughs> meetings go. And it was just great. <laughs> a little bit casual for the newbie here. Um, I just wanted to ask this question, like what would be, so a lot of the screening stuff is in our effect, you know that we're the Hubbard, we're the uh, Fourth Lane people. So I wondered what responsibility we may have for people that may be driving back and forth um, on Forest Lane. Normally it's just like, well, it's a right away, we don't pay that much attention. Is there any added things we should be concerned about for the, that property back there now that it, it's what it's gonna be or if it will be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Thanks for asking that. We talked about this a fair amount today. Um, the um, so the the forest lane we're going to improve uh, forest lane, right? Uh, right. We're going to improve that road, um, and then at the end of the road, <clears throat> just in from where the um, the snow um, piles are. Um, it's going to go, the road will go right into the fence, which will have a locked gate. And, and then the, and that road that we, that we build and improve on, it will end right at a locked gate. Um, we, you know, we only, per the agreement we have with the landowner, we really only have rights 
to that area, the access road, um, like yourself as an abutter, we we're you know we share that road. Um, okay. And then, but in terms of, I think it was um, Greg that brought it up. Your neighbor, you know, people ripping in, in and out with uh, four wheelers and whatnot. Um, you know, I we aren't going to be able to do much on that. But I think that's something where we, you know, the landowner um, has a no uh, four wheeler, no ATV policy, as I understand it. And um, it would be up to the landowner to, uh, yeah. you know, take further action, whether it's posting or what have you. So I, I, was, was that a helpful answer? Yeah, I, I, again, I apologize. My husband and I didn't get a chance to really chat it up between the site visit and me getting home. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I'm available for any questions at any time too, if anything else comes up at any time, so. And I would just funnel that through James and the planning board. Yep, okay. yep. Yeah, I'm always available and I, I don't live far away, so I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions, demystify some of this stuff. Okay, thanks. Hi guys, this is Jen. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Brett, it and this is for James too. And if this has already been completed, I do apologize because I haven't been in the office. I'm just coming back <laughs> from maternity leave. So um there really needs to be some sort of plan in place for that road maintenance. Um, if my understanding is forest lane is a private road, is that correct, James? Yep, private privately road. maintained, right? So what I'd like to see happen, even if you guys just put something quick in writing, I'd like to figure out who's going to maintain this road, um, what parts are going to be maintained by who, whatever you guys want to do. I, I would like to see some sort of plan put together for this road because ever since this application kind of came to light, I've been kind of like following it and stuff. And there's really nothing in there about who's going to do what. So and the question just came up again about road maintenance. So maybe if you guys just talk to James or you guys can talk to me about it if you want to, but there really should be some sort of plan put in place, even if it's a quick, quick something in writing, um, unless James, you don't feel like they need to, but I really think that with a private um, maintained road like this, they really should do something. Yeah, uh, thanks. I mean, I, I'm and my, my first thought, and I could be wrong, is that this might be something that the landowner would set up maybe some kind of agreement or I don't know. Let's, let's figure out how the best way to solve that. Um, Cause for sure we, we, you know, we're, we're going to make sure that we're um, we leave the road better or as good as it is now. And certainly uh, I'd be, you know, willing to commit that if we caused any harm, it would be improved. Uh, repaired and improved and i'm not concerned about that and, and i'm happy to be part of that it sounds like there's a bigger question if there's other landowners that use this road whether it's um, some kind of agreement between all the landowners i'm not sure the right way to solve that but i think we should take that we can take that offline and figure something out the best way to have that covered yeah i think it'd be i mean jen does Great, great point. I think just having something, I think the most important thing is, at, you know, during and after the the major site work is done, because ongoing, the actual trips that are going to be created on Forest Lane for maintenance is how many per year? Yeah, right? just two, twice a year, you know, a few, one truck, one pickup truck twice a year, so, you know, two or four times a year, something like that. Yeah, and that's what I, yeah, that's what I told Mark. I'm like, I'm not worried, you know, not so much about the, the sustainment. I'm just worried about that four to six months of heavy duty activity that comes up and down this, this right of way. I also think that we need to protect um, the owners of Forest Lane, just in case there is an emergency out there, the fire trucks have to get down there. There's other crews that have to get down there. That all plays into it too. So I think it's great what you're saying, Brett. And I totally believe that you guys will leave it better than you found it. But I would like to see something come across in writing before the work gets started. Okay. Yeah. Jeez, Jennifer, yeah. Thank you. I hadn't actually even considered that, right? Um, that's a very good point. It's already small enough and turning, um, you know, turning its way, you know, around with emergency vehicles could be a concern depending upon where the vehicles and stuff are parked. So thank you. That's correct. And a solar farm doesn't, for I'm sure it doesn't, have like a big need for something like that to happen. But you know what? We always want to protect yeah. our ourselves in that case that we protect our, 
you know, essential workers, emergency personnel, and we protect you guys as landowners on that same road. So that's all we're doing it for. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Quick, quick comment. I'm glad you brought that up, Jen. I did have some email correspondence with the fire chief uh, last month before the meeting. He had some questions about what we already talked about hazards, um, you know, training and whatnot. So we did talk more today uh, via email about uh, vehicle access. Um, so the access road we designed inside the fence for trucks to come in and out and maneuver. And, and part of that is, is like what Brett's talked about training with emergency personnel is that there's going to be a lock gate, but all local personnel will have access to that in case of emergency. So that way they can get into the facility if they need to, or they can pull in and turn around and get out. Um, so we've, that's been an ongoing conversation with, with the fire chief. So that was a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So you guys did the, did he have a conversation with you about putting a Knox box out there? We, yeah, not today, but we've talked about that to have training with police, fire, EMT, whoever needs access will, will have the Knox box access. Yeah, that's a requirement, a standard procedure for us. Yep. All right. So let's take an action, Drew, um, to, to address the, let's come up with some language that um, talks about our um, improvement and maintenance, uh, the, the sort of how we're going to take care of the access road um, during the construction phase. And then, yeah, you know, let's figure out some language we can craft and uh, have as one of the conditions, uh, you know, and then we can, and then for long-term, you know, let's take this offline because I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but I know we'll, we'll be able to figure something out. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? If not, we'll close the public comment section. I got an informational item, if I may. Okay. Great Falls Construction is looking to demolish the prime buildings this month. That means the buildings are coming down this month. Oops. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. That's all. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? For... We're at the adjournment. Adjournment. James? Yeah. Um, let's talk further about that um, whenever you have a second, okay? Okay. Okay. Hey, so Beth and Mark, just want to thank everybody for, you know, obviously letting us be part of this. We continue to want to be part of it. It looks like all the partners are wanting to really do this right. So we appreciate you listening to us and uh, we'll just keep moving forward. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, then I'd be looking for a motion for adjournment. Paul. <clears throat> I move that we adjourn the meeting of the planning board from March 4th, 2021. I'll second that. <laughs> All in favor? I vote. Aye. Aye. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.